precious rainforest in Australia, where a botanical wonderland conserves a celebration of colorful orchids. Enjoy the surprising flower beds and unique personality of two remarkable community gardens in New York City. And explore a sophisticated and fascinating Renaissance-style estate in Portugal. Join us now for a delightful World Garden Tour. World Garden Tour begins in the city of Cairns in Australia's northwest Queensland. This tropical getaway resort with its beautiful mountains and beaches lies just off the coast of the Great Barrier Reef. Not long ago, much of Cairns was covered with tropical rainforest, abundant with plant and animal life. Today, less than 1% of the rainforest is left, and the remaining parcel is so precious that it has been sanctioned as a world conservation area. Cairns itself was actually a mosaic of different complex environments, ranging from mangroves right through to solid rainforests, etc. Just off one of Cairns' busy roads lies a tropical lowland rainforest that contains an amazing diversity of plant life. So we are the only wet tropics rainforest botanic gardens in Australia. We collect plants from all over the tropics of the world and we grow them in exactly the same situations as you would find them in their own native countries. Rather than make single garden beds as you would in temperate zones like putting up the roses and putting up the tulips and stuff like that. We don't do that. We plant these as they would be found in the wild. A boardwalk provides an environmentally safe way to explore the fragile, swampy ecosystem. From this vantage point, visitors can view exotic palms and tropical flowers. Beginning from the garden's end, we would find a palm forest of native Alexander palms with an under forest floor herbage of gingers and uh, other young trees. On their journey through the rainforest, visitors will encounter giant paper bark trees, like this 700 year old specimen. Native Aborigines use the bark to make canoes and waterproof clothing. The leaves were used to make an aromatic herbal tea. The native hibiscus, unable to grow upright in the swampy soil, twists its way up neighboring trees. And at a bend in the boardwalk, a splendid example of a strangler fig grows around the trunk of a large paperbark tree. This massive fig tree started off as a small seed deposited in the paper bark by a bird. The strangler fig's tentacle-like roots grew around the paper bark, eventually forming a trunk which surrounds the host tree. Continuing an exploration of the wet rainforest, visitors will pass by beautiful red beech trees, outstanding against the textured gray bark of the surrounding trees. As we move through and the moisture content begins to increase as we head towards the swamps, we would find rainforest trees beginning to disappear, more swamp-loving trees appearing. This area of the rainforest is the Pandana Swamp, a region punctuated by the appearance of climbing swamp ferns and large pandanus trees. At the end of the rainforest boardwalk lies a cool freshwater lake, home to delicate flowering lilies and other aquatic plants. The rainforest boardwalk has succeeded in preserving some of the native wetlands. However, botanical conservation has a long history in the Cairns area. Across the road from the rainforest is the Flecker Botanic Gardens, founded in 1886. Covering more than 80 acres, these gardens are home to a dazzling variety of orchids and other tropical plants collected from around the world. One of the Flecker Gardens pays special tributes to the Aborigines, who settled in Australia 100,000 years ago. Paradensible, a tall, dense tree, was used by the Aborigines to make spears and music sticks. The Aboriginal plant use garden is an area where we've concentrated many of the plants used 
by rainforest Aboriginal people who lived in this area in their daily lives. These plants included food plants, plants which gave them uh, shelter, plants which gave them medicines and other useful items such as making baskets. These plants are still found widely through the rainforest here, but true to the, the fashion of rainforests, they're scattered and the Aboriginals themselves used to have to travel great distances through the forest in many cases to find the plants that they were looking for for certain purposes. The Aborigines area leads to the orchid house. There's always a spectacular show. Our major orchid season uh, flowering is around September and that's the major time but there's always species which are flowering at different times of the year so we usually have a very good display there. Like the orchid house, the Fern House provides a natural environment where scientists can study rainforest plants like Colocasia and Philodendron. Visitors can marvel at the diverse and unusual displays of ferns and aeroids, like this lovely anthurium. And they can commune with nature, all within a cool, peaceful indoor forest in the middle of a busy city. The Flecker Botanic Gardens is unique in that Living in the wet tropics of Australia, existing in the wet tropics of Australia, it illustrates the need for conservation of our remaining wilderness areas and the importance of not only just the plants, but the interactions between animals, insects, plants and our own existence. Later, we'll take a closer look at some of the lush plants at Flecker Botanical Garden that grow well in many indoor gardens. But when World Garden Tour returns, discover how, amid the towering buildings, New York City finds space for beautiful and bountiful community gardens. World Garden Tour now travels to New York City, a city where it's often a challenge just to find enough green space for a garden. Yet hidden within this concrete jungle are several intimate community gardens and each one provides a peaceful, private oasis for its neighbors. This is the Liz Christie Garden. It's the oldest of nearly 800 community gardens in New York. For more than 20 years, this secret hideaway has brought new life to one of Manhattan's East Village neighborhoods. Well, it's like an oasis, and that's what a lot of people tell us. They, many people are astonished when they accidentally come upon us and wander in the gate and say, what are you doing here? You're about the last thing we'd expect to find here. Uh, there are a lot of uh, buildings, concrete, uh, cars, vehicles, heat, everything. So when you come in here, it's a little bit cooler, slightly quieter, but certainly a lot more beautiful. Back in 1972, the garden's namesake, Liz Christie, was discouraged by the look of her neighborhood, particularly this corner on Houston Street. It was a vacant lot at the time, overflowing with weeds and debris and guarded by a fence. Frustrated with the neglected lot, Christy and her friends decided to take action. They began by tossing water balloons filled with seeds over the fence. After seeing magnificent plants and flowers come to life from those few seeds, the city allowed the neighbors inside the overgrown lot to create the beautiful garden oasis that exists here today. We basically have 20 members and about 30 plots, and so, so obviously some of the members have more than one plot. And some, our plots are small, some plots are large. It really has a lot to do with how much energy a particular member wants to expend on their, on their garden, how much time they want to spend here. Members get their own individual plots after they've shown their dedication by volunteering their time to help keep the entire garden beautiful. With different members creating and designing their own individual spaces, it only makes sense that each garden plot has a unique personality. The garden is filled with unexpected treasures at every turn. For instance, this beautiful pond is tucked away in a shaded, peaceful corner of the garden. The pond, of course, is by far and away our most popular feature. Uh, many people come to visit the turtles on a regular basis. Along with the turtles, the fish in the pond make it hard to believe that this garden is in the middle of a crowded city. One other feature contributing to the countryside illusion is the Boston ivy clinging to the neighboring building. It's been growing here for nearly 25 years and creates a lovely green backdrop for the garden. The ivy, along with the evergreens, 
makes green the dominant color in the Liz Christie garden. Here in the city, it's extremely important that the garden be beautiful 12 months of the year. And of course, that largely depends on evergreen plants. So we have evergreen shrubs, trees, ground covers, vines, uh, not only for the public to have something beautiful to look at, for ourselves as well. These community gardeners have taken full advantage of discarded building materials from sites around the city. Old bricks have been recycled and used as pavers, creating small pathways that wind throughout the garden. And the old chain link fence that kept people out of the once vacant lot has been replaced with a much more welcoming wrought iron fence topped with a wooden pergola. The fence that surrounds the garden is really important for a lot of reasons. Number one, security is a big issue. Uh, but we know that the garden should be appreciated at the times when we're not here and the garden's closed. So we consciously, again, clothe some parts of the fence with plants and vines, but we also want to leave some parts of it open so that people can enjoy it when they're just walking by. As beautiful as a Liz Christie garden may be to passers-by, to the neighborhood gardeners, it's an opportunity to rejuvenate their spirit by giving back to the community. Another neighborhood garden hideaway can be found in Manhattan's Harlem community. The Success Garden began in 1990 when the Parks Council came to the aid of the Harlem community to develop an outdoor space in an abandoned vacant lot that was filled with rubble. After the rubble and debris were removed, this garden treasure began to blossom. But this once vacant lot was not all that was transformed. The lives of many people in this community were also changed, particularly the children. Well, the Success Garden sits right across the street from uh, Public School 275, and it really has become an extension of the classroom. There are classes that come through and do mathematics and reading words based on different uh, plant names that become spelling words. So it has really blossomed into an outside classroom. During the school year, the plots are used by the students for various science experiments. But during the summer, the community comes in and they use the plots to grow their vegetables, uh, corn, uh, tomatoes, for their you know, cooking. In the woodlands area of the Success Garden, wonderful peach trees bear sweet fruit. And a cherry tree tempts many of the students. In the early hours of the garden, we have to assist the young people to get to school because they've climbed the cherry trees and are picking the cherries before they should. The children learn about ecology from the garden's bog. In the Success Gardens, in our aim to understand the complete diversity of their ecology, we wanted a water feature and we created a pond and a bog area for the young people to observe the differences in the ecology when you have water. Students study a variety of water plants here, from water lilies to tall aquatic grasses that grow from the pond. Democracy is also taught in the Success Garden. Instead of one student determining which features to include, the students vote on ideas for the garden. When Carneal presented pictures of English gazebos, one student recommended they build one in their garden. Clearly, the motion passed. The Success Garden has completely transformed the community, not only physically, but the spirit. And that spirit can be clearly seen and felt in this hidden urban oasis they created for the entire community to enjoy. When we return, we'll travel to scenic Portugal to visit a magnificent royal villa garden that exemplifies the beauty and creativity of the Italian Renaissance. The next stop on World Garden Tour is Portugal to visit Lisbon's Palacio Frontiera. This beautiful palace and garden is distinguished by its great stairways, glazed tile galleries, and decorative parterres. On first glance, one might think this was a 16th century Renaissance garden. But in fact, the garden was created in the 17th century at a time when noblemen were more dedicated to warfare 
than decorative garden design and great works of art. The artistic Marquis de Frontiera believed in exuberant detailing throughout his palace and gardens. Italian in style, the magnificent palace gardens are designed to remain perennially green throughout each season. The front, or grand garden, was expressly designed to be viewed from the terraces. Visitors can step out onto a wide, open terrace and gallery. Gazing out over the grand garden, the intricacies of the parterres are revealed. White, red, and pink roses peek over the clipped boxwoods, which form geometrical and symmetrical streets and alleys. Twelve mythological statues and scores of topiary rise up from the enormous maze. Perhaps the most impressive topiary, shaped from a U, is also the oldest. Triangular in shape, this dramatic botanical work of art is more than 300 years old. To the west of the Grand Garden is a large reflecting pool, bordered by two marble staircases. Handsome horsemen in feather caps decorate the retaining wall, while a majestic stairway leads to an elegant pavilion and the Gallery of Kings. 24 marble busts representing past kings of Portugal are set into the gallery niches. Unusual coppery metallic tiles line the niches, while hand-painted tiles depicting pine cones embellish the gallery and add to the artistry of the garden. At the center of the gallery, an elegant pavilion offers another wondrous view of the Grand Garden and the city of Lisbon beyond. As visitors leave the Gallery of Kings, they move into the Garden of Venus. Decorative bands of tile work cover the arches of a pavilion at the far end of this garden. Here in this intimate garden, groupings of ferns and palms surround an elaborate tank ornamented with dolphin statues. At the edge of the garden, there's a grotto, decorated with intricate patterns of shells, fragments, oriental china, black glass, and flint glass. Portuguese painted tile walls above the planters depict allegorical figures of science and the arts. The gardens of the Palacio Frontiera are romantic in their Renaissance splendor, yet distinctively Portuguese in their artistic embellishments. Splashed with the vivid colors of Mediterranean blue, indigo, and terracotta, visitors can enjoy a bucolic atmosphere that's a delight to the senses and a delightful piece of garden history. When World Garden Tour returns, we'll revisit the Flecker Botanical Garden in Australia, where you will discover rainforest plants that you can grow in many of your homes and gardens. Sheriff, the McSweeney's are tearing up the town! Garden Tour now returns to the Flecker Botanic Gardens in Cairns, Australia, for a closer look at the tropical plants in this diverse garden. The tall canopy of the rainforest, like this one in Australia, shelters shade-loving plants and keeps the humidity high. Most plants need sunlight, but many plants, even flowering ones, do well in partial sunlight or even shade. Ferns, once extremely popular in Victorian times, are showing up again in well-designed homes and gardens. These delicate, lacy plants thrive outdoors in warmer zones beneath taller plants and trees where they're happy in dappled sunlight. Many ferns, like Boston fern, thrive indoors as well, without direct sunlight. Aeroids can be identified by their flowers, which have a fleshy spike wrapped by a hood called a spathe. Some better known aeroids are philodendron, Diefenbachia, pothos, anthurium, and peace lily. Aeroids perform best in bright, indirect light and with soil that's kept moist but not soggy. 
Even the smallest garden can have a woodland feeling by planting a few ferns along with other perennials such as philodendron and palms. Many palms, like various lady palms, do well indoors, placed in bright but not direct light, and also outdoors in southern gardens. Southern gardeners can also introduce orchids into their gardens by tying them onto a tree or arranging them in pots. And northern gardeners can grow orchids indoors in bright light. Many homes and gardens can feel and look like the beautiful tropical rainforests of Australia with a little planning and by providing the appropriate light and soil conditions, your garden can reward you with interesting textures and lush, vigorous plants. From Australia's beautiful botanical rainforest, to New York City's remarkable community gardens, to Lisbon's stunning Renaissance Palace Gardens, we thank you for joining us on World Garden Tour and hope to see you again next time.